Hi guys, welcome to Gaming Watcher. My name is Rolson and in this video I'll go through everything that we know so far about Destiny 2 Beyond Light. So Beyond Light is set to release the 10th of November, which is very soon and so far Bungie has released a lot of trailers and information on what is coming. We've gotten info about the locations, the story, the gameplay changes, the weapons, the sandbox updates and so on and there is a lot to take in. So if you, like me, have lost track a little bit, let's get the full overview of what is coming to Destiny Destiny 2 this November. Let's get into it. So let's begin with our feet on the ground. Where are we going to fight the enemies of humanity when we go beyond light? The new destination added with this expansion is Europa, the icy moon of Jupiter. And it looks pretty much exactly like the real thing actually. So Europa is this icy moon inhabited from what we have seen by Fallen, Vex and the Pyramids, a cold wasteland shrouded in darkness and snowstorms. Long lost cities of humanity are covered in the thick ice as well as the deep stone crypt, the birthplace of the Exos, which we will also get to explore on this location. It looks like Europa is going to be a fairly big destination with five patrol zones and it also looks like there might be two planet vendors, the Exo Stranger and Varix the Loyal. Bungie has said that they have made new weather systems just for Europa so that the weather can be dynamic and snowstorms can randomly begin out of nowhere. During a snowstorm the visibility will be severely affected so you won't be able to see enemies around you. I think that this is a very neat trick to be able to create different kinds of scenarios playing out in the same location. Bungie also said that the weather systems would be used for storytelling, so I expect them to use that for the campaign of course, but also for the seasonal story content, adventures and so on. Another location that is not new, but has not before been playable in Destiny 2 is the Cosmodrome from Destiny 1, which is also returning to Earth with Beyond Light. Where Destiny 2 has EDC, Destiny 1 had the Cosmodrome, and it is this rusty dry wasteland in old Russia that we get to play a little sequence of in the very first mission of Destiny 2. Now the entire location will be added back into the game and by the end of Beyond Light, three strikes and one raid will also have returned. An interesting thing to notice about the Cosmodrome is the possible return of Aldrin Sov as an NPC. He has been rumored to be the new vendor for the Cosmodrome, which might also make a lot of sense story-wise. I'll get more into that in the next segment, but let's just finish up the Cosmodrome. The location is fairly big with many different zones to explore. There are actually 19 names named areas within the Cosmodrome, so even though it's not exactly new, I'm still looking forward to this whole big chunk of content being put into the game. I might have played this content in Destiny 1, but I'm even more excited to play it in Destiny 2 with all of the changes that have been made to the game. That is the two locations that are being added to the game, but there are also locations leaving the game with Beyond Light. This is the four locations being attacked by the Pyramids, Mars, Io, Titan and Mercury. These locations along with all content belonging to them are going away indefinitely. So before I continue into the story segment of this video where I talk about the story of Beyond Light, I just want to take one moment to thank all of you guys that subscribe to the channel. And if you're watching and you're not yet subscribed and you're not a part of the Gaming Watcher Discord yet, consider becoming part of it. We're really having fun in there playing Destiny, doing raids together. Also, if you find this video useful, please be sure to leave a like to let me know that you like the content and that I should make more. Anyways, let's get into the story. Just recently, some story trailers have been released by Bungie and a few things are clear, but a lot is not. So let's try to sort out what we know so far. The first thing that we came to know about the story was from the reveal trailer, where we see the Drifter, Iris and the Exo Stranger meet up on Europa. It is clear from the trailer that the Exo Stranger has called them there and that it was because of a pyramid ship hovering above the ice. From looking closely at the trailer we also see that Eris is using what looks very much like Stasis, the new darkness damage type that is also being added with Beyond Light. This would definitely have some impact on the story and so far there have been a lot of speculation about Eris actually being corrupted by the darkness and working with them to get the Guardians turned to the dark side so to speak. The Drifter's role is even more unclear but but the Drifter is also a character that has had his run-ins with the darkness before. It is known that the Drifter has made some sort of pact with the entities called the Nine and that he somehow can control Taken. We also know that he has the Guardians collect modes of darkness in Gambit. Also the Drifter does not refer to himself as a Guardian, he's just called a Lightbearer. So there are many things that hint some sort of affiliation with the darkness. So both the Drifter and Ares are likely candidates to have embraced the darkness before us. Then there are the four 
Fallen. It seems that the main storyline of the campaign is about the Fallen having settled on Europa and found the darkness. Iramis, a fallen kill and former baroness of the House of Devils, is their leader. The House of Devils is coincidentally a fallen house that inhabited the Cosmodrome in Destiny 1, the zone that is being added to Earth. It seems that Iramis has found the darkness somehow and is rallying her troops on Europa to tell them that they are now free from the chains of the light. She makes a speech about being pawns of their own devices. I think she's talking about the fact that the Fallen is chasing the Traveler around, trying to get this light back, living off ether produced by the servitors. Iramis wants to use the darkness to get their strength back without the Traveler's light. She even talks about making the great machine meaning the Traveler, know their pain. So it might not even just be about severing ties with the Traveler, but also actually destroying it. Somehow this is threatening the Fallen, because Varix seems to be calling the Guardians to Europa to help save his kind as he says in the trailer. Varix makes a distress call to the Guardians and that is why we are on Europa. How this is connected to Eris, the Drifter and their meeting with the Exo Stranger, we don't know, but one thing is clear. Both Varix and the Exo Stranger talks about the strength to control the darkness in the story previews that have been released. Varix talks about Iramis being obsessed with the darkness and that it has changed her. He then says that maybe you are different. It's worth mentioning here that it has been revealed that the Exo Stranger is actually Elsie Bray, the sister of Anna Bray. She has been made into an Exo because she was sick and dying from a disease called the Clovis Curse. The lore books released with the collector's editions of Beyond Light talk about this and the fact that Clovis had the same disease and that this might be the reason for creating the Exos in the first place. Throughout all of the promotion material and information we have gotten from Bungie, it is constantly said that there are a lot of secrets under the ice. We see this red glow coming from under the ice and in this new Vidoc they start out by saying that life has been detected under the ice. It's also said that a lot of research facilities was made on Europa by Clovis and that these are mainly underground. And then it is said that maybe they got into things that they shouldn't have in those facilities. So putting all of this information together, it would not surprise me if we found out that Clovis discovered the darkness or stasis and made it into these crystals that we see the Exo Stranger carrying. It also wouldn't surprise me if Clovis actually succeeded in attaining eternal life by becoming an Exo. I think we might meet Clovis in Beyond Light and I think that we also might fight him because he has been corrupted by the darkness. That is why the stranger talks about the ability to control stasis, because Clovis could not. This is just my own speculation though. So Iramis has found the darkness, been corrupted by it, and then she wants to use it to destroy the Traveler. We are called by Varix and the Stranger, and they both talk about us using the darkness against Aramis. That is going to be the story of the campaign. Aramis has four lieutenants, Atrax, Critis, Felix and Praxis. I wonder if these are all going to be bosses in the campaign like the Barons in Forsaken. We don't know what these lieutenants are going to be used for, but they wield stasis powers and we have seen them fighting guardians in one of the gameplay trailers. On Bungie.net at the very top of the story page for Beyond Light there is this quote, a growing divide echoes in our collective unconscious. Precious gifts bestowed by the traveler, unspeakable evil brought forth by the pyramid. As division spreads and distrust grows between alliances long thought unbreakable, the truth we hold dear will be questioned. Guardian, is there more to the darkness than we thought? This division that is mentioned could very well mean that some of the guardians that we know will turn evil. There might actually be a divide between good guardians and evil guardians in this new era of destiny. This is further supported in the Vidoc that Bungie has just released where it is said that the darkness is dividing the vanguard. Some guardians feel that we should get to know the darkness and harness its power to fight the enemies of humanity. Then the last sentence, is there more to the darkness than we thought, I think hints at the tale that we have gotten through lore about the gardener and the winnower. Without getting into too much detail about this complicated piece of lore, it basically tells a story of two forces balancing each other out, like good and evil 
evil. It then tells the story of these two forces getting into some sort of disagreement and starting to fight each other, accidentally creating the universe as they go at it. The two forces now take their conflict into the universe, so I guess that the line about there being more to the darkness than we know is referring to this and that we are getting more information about what the darkness actually is, what this balance is between the dark and the light and how we as guardians play into that. I think that is going to be the underlying story of this expansion as well as the next two. We as guardians are going to directly participate in this battle between the two forces and help restore balance. This is also mentioned in the Vida. The last thing that I want to mention story-wise is the fact that Aldrin Soft is coming back to Destiny 2. Finally, Lore has hinted at the fact that Aldrin was stumbling around somewhere in the Cosmodrome. He is lost because he does not remember what he has done, but everyone else does. He's also going to play a part in the story in the first season of Beyond Light, where we are partnering up with him and Osiris to fight Sivu on Wrath and the army that she is building. But I think that we can expect that Aldrin has a bigger role to play in the whole story of Beyond Light across all of the seasons. In this segment, I will go through the new stasis damage type that is being added into the game as well as the new subclasses that go along with it. Because this is going to change up the gameplay a lot. This new damage type is adding a stunning and freezing capabilities to the game which we have not really seen before in this way. Building barriers or platforms out of ice also looks to be a quite game changing element coming with stasis and then the whole subclass model is being reworked. Let's get into it. So first off the stasis damage type. This is an ice damage type that looks to have a lot of crowd control elements built into it. Three new subclasses will also be added one for each class. These new subclasses have all been showcased and they look awesome. Let's take a closer look at each of them. First we'll take a look at the Warlock Shadebinder. This is the Warlock Stasis subclass and what we know so far is that the super of the subclass is called Winter's Wrath and summons a powerful stasis staff whose projectiles instantly freeze their targets. Then you can detonate the staff's crystals to send a shockwave of destruction towards your frozen foes, shattering them in the process. Then we also have gotten information about the melee ability of the subclass called Penum Blast. This fires stasis energy from your staff and freezes opponents in their tracks. So the Warlock is really going to be able to do a lot of crowd control with this subclass, it looks like. Then we have the Hunter subclass, the Revenant. Super of the subclass is going to be Silence and Squall. When activated, you channel stasis shards to form a deadly pair of karma blades. Throw the first blades towards enemies and freeze them in place. Followed up with the second blade, which detonates on impact and creates a stasis storm that hunts down stragglers. The melee ability for the Revenant is Withering Blade. With this melee ability, you can hurl sharp etched shuriken into the fray. These stasis powered projectiles bounce off multiple foes, damaging and slowing them. So, this is what we have seen in in the stasis gameplay trailers earlier. The third subclass is the Titan Behemoth. The super of this subclass is called Glacial Quake and works like this. You forge a mighty stasis gauntlet and slam the gauntlet into the ground, sending shock waves of stasis crystals that freeze nearby enemies. So these are the subclasses, but there is much more to them than this. The subclasses are customizable. So how does that work? Well, in the Vidoc it was explained that you are going to have what is called aspects and and fragments. These seem like mods for your subclass, sort of. You get a short glimpse of two aspects and two fragments from the Warlock subclass. The aspects are Ice Flare Bolts, which does that shattering an enemy grants a small amount of grenade energy and creates seekers that seek out and freeze nearby enemies. And Frost Pulse, which does so that casting your rift creates a shockwave that freezes nearby enemies. Then we are shown two fragments. Whisper of Hadrons, which give bonus weapon damage after freezing a target with stasis, but cost minus 10 strength. And then Whisper of Fissures, which increase the damage and size of the bursts of stasis when destroying a stasis crystal or defeating a frozen target. So this is the way that you can customize your stasis subclass and make different builds depending on the situation. I'm really excited to get my hands on all of these different fragments and aspects to see what you can make with them. It sounds really cool. So another thing that is greatly 
going to affect the gameplay of Beyond Light is the Darkness Zones. It has been revealed that on Europa there will be so called Darkness Zones. We don't know what these are exactly but it would make sense that they would be for instance zones where the use of light is restricted and you can only use stasis. This might also be why we kind of have to embrace the darkness to fight these enemies on Europa. So for the weapons and armor we have some exotics of course and then we have some legendary weapons and armor that we have been shown but that we don't know that much about. So let's talk about the exotics. No time to explain is the first one that I want to bring up because it's such a legendary weapon in the world of destiny. This weapon was gifted to the guardian by the exo stranger when completing the destiny 1 vanilla campaign. Back then the weapon had one exotic perk called rewind again that returned all precision hits to the magazine. Now in this new version of the weapon you have the same perk but it stacks and when you get enough stacks a tiny portal will open up that fires shots from an alternate timeline. So this is kind of the arc soul, the little bolt of arc that hangs beside your head and shoots at enemies. I am truly excited to get my hands on this pulse rifle and see what it can do. Next up we have the cloud strike. This sniper rifle creates lightning bolts at the target location when you hit precision hits. Rapid precision shots will summon an entire storm at the point of impact. It kind of looks like there's a stasis crystal built into the rifle, so maybe this weapon will have the stasis damage type. Then we have the Lament. This is a chainsaw sword. There's really no need to explain any more about this. It's a freaking chainsaw sword, okay? Okay, maybe it also makes sense to mention how you turn it on. When you block with the sword, the chainsaw will be activated and then you can thread through basically anything, even barrier champions. Also, at its peak, damaging an enemy will heal the wielder. Salvation's Grip. This one we know for sure is a stasis damage type weapon. It's a grenade launcher and each fired projectile will create stasis crystals that will freeze nearby targets. You can charge it to increase the amount of crystals created and the freeze radius. Now let's take a look at the exotic armor pieces that have been revealed so far. First off we have a titan exotic gauntlet called Icefall Mantle. Stand tall against the oncoming hordes with this reinforced armor that replaces the titan's barricade overshield, absorbing damage from incoming fire. Then there is the titan helmet, precious scars, prove your strength even when coming back from the brink. Upon revives the titan gains an overshield aura that protects the wearer and nearby allies. Then there is a hunter exotic helmet, mask of Bacris. Don the mask to replace the hunter's dodge ability with a long range shift ability that also temporarily cloaks the wearer during use. Then there is also a pair of hunter exotic gauntlets called Athra's Embrace. The hunter's weighted knife gains a second ricochet. Rapid precision hits gain a damage bonus and can temporarily stagger enemies. Next we have a warlock exotic helmet called Dawn Chorus. The warlock's daybreak projectiles deal extra damage and cause enemies to burn on contact. Gain melee energy each time a burn damages the target. Then there's the warlock exotic gauntlets called Necrotic Grip. A deadly caress compounded. Melee attacks corrupt enemies with increasing damage over time. Defeating a corrupted combatant spreads the corruption to nearby targets and restores melee energy. And that is all of the exotics that we currently know about in Beyond Light. Then there is a legendary arsenal and we really don't know that much about this except for how it looks. We have the armor sets that have been shown several times. I think these look pretty cool. They have this kind of survival gear feeling to them so it looks like something that you would actually wear if you were going someplace like Europa. Then we have been shown this set of weapons. They have this red metallic look to them and we know that one of them has a scope that can show enemies through a snowstorm so that might really come in handy with the weather systems on Europa. I think what we have in this arsenal is a pulse or a scout rifle, a sidearm, an assault rifle, a rocket launcher and a shotgun. So, just this week, Bungie completely changed up the sandbox for Beyond Light. There are a lot of big changes here and this is going to have a huge impact on what loadouts would be the best for Beyond Light. First off, hand cannons. Bungie is making changes to give hand cannon subfamilies more diversity and more reasons to use them. So first off, the aggressive frames. Here they have increased the rate of fire from 110 to 120. Then they broke out aggressive hand cannons, allowing custom tuning of stats. For example, 
damage fall of 100 range in the subfamily now starts at 32 meters. Adaptive and precision frames. Range that now has more impact on minimum damage fall off range for both archetypes. Damage fall off for 100 range now starts at 25 meters before it was 20 meters. So for the precision hand cannons, the 180 rate of fire ones has had their magazine scaled up by 37%. This also affects exotics with that rate of fire. So for the lightweight frames which has been folded into adaptive frames, they moved all lightweight hand cannons 150 rate of fire to the adaptive subfamily 140 rate of fire. This, this includes Luna's Howl and Not Forgotten. One exotic hand cannon will though retain the 150 rate of fire and it's sunshot. So for sniper rifles, Bungie wants sniper rifles to feel powerful without being so easy to use that they dominate. So they adjusted how aim assist is affected by sniper rifle zoom level. Lower zoom scopes have less aim assist, higher zoom scopes have more. Scopes with around 50 zoom are unchanged. So the lowest zoom scopes have a large reduction in aim assist cone angle and the highest zoom scopes have a small increase. Auto Rifles In the season of the Worthy, the Adaptive Archetype 600 rate of fire was given a buff. Now Bungie is pulling that back a little to keep it in check with other Auto Rifle archetypes. So for Adaptive Frames, damage per bullet is reduced from 15.75 to 14.25. And here they just note that prior to the season of the Worthy, damage per bullet was 1375 so we're still higher than prior to the season of the worthy for scout rifles it says in the twop that scouts have a reasonable time to kill and can't be adjusted too much without making them dominate the battlefield so we're making them a little easier to use they increased how much each point of the aim assist stat widens the aim assist cone at maximum the aim assist cone is now 15 percent wider rocket launches so these heavy weapons currently have very low reserves, so we're adjusting that. We expect to take another look at rocket launches in a future season, the TWAP says. So they increase the reserve by one or two rockets depending on the inventory stat. So this is not at all enough to make rocket launches interesting again, really. But I guess it's a start that they are beginning to look at rocket launches at least. So there are some general changes also that Bungie has made uh, based on features feedback from the users. So let's just go through that. First of all, perks. Outlaw. Reload speed increase felt insufficient with certain subfamilies and combinations of roles. For example with aggressive hand cannons. So they increased the reload stat bonus from plus 50 to plus 70. So for Merciless, the exotic fusion rifle, they have increased the inventory set from 36 to 55 and this increases the ammo reserves. Mountain top. So they say they have had a ton of feedback that the mountaintop feels a bit over the top in crucible modes. Oh really? This pinnacle weapon has had ample time to shine so we're taking it down a notch. It's about goddamn time Bungie. So here are the changes um, that they have made to the mountaintop. They re they're reducing the splash damage by 33% increased uh, impact damage, so the total damage is only 5% lower than before, but you actually have to hit your target with it, not just kill it with splash damage. Then they reduce the projectile velocity multiplier from the micro missile perk from 1.4 to 1.2, so now 20% faster than other breach grenade launchers instead of 40% faster. Then they reduce the in air accuracy. So now it has significant projectile error while in air around 7 degrees without the Icarus grip mod. Substantially less with falling guillotine. Now that just makes me sad Bungie that you would go in and nerf this. But come on we all know that that was about to happen. So it, we had a fun run while it lasted. So they reduced the heavy attack damage by 24% to bring it in line with other swords. God damn it. Falling guillotine will continue to be slightly above average, just not to the extent that it is now. Well, it's just 
It's a sad day. A sad day for all of us guys. Meter multi tool and meter mini tool. So they move the meter synergy trait to the intrinsic similar to how the Baroque version works. They added the following perks. Hipfire grip, kill clip. And then they say there is an issue with the masterwork on this weapon that prevents it from being upgraded. This will be fixed in a later update. And then there's another note here saying the gunsmith will begin selling a version of this weapon on November 10th with no infusion cap. So I guess this is part of the thing they have been talking about, about buying uh, exotics in Beyond Light. So we might just be able to buy all of these exotics from the gunsmith. So Storm and Drang. Drang. They have moved the Together Forever trade to the intrinsic similar to how the Baroque version works. Added the following perks. Accurized Ram moving target and then there are the same two notes as on the other one that there's something wrong with the masterwork and that the gunsmiths will begin selling a version of this weapon on November 10th. Then we have Ruinous Effigy, Transmutation Fears. So they reduce the damage of the aerial melee attack by 25% and they significantly reduce the damage of the drain effect on enemy combatants. Then we have Arbalast. It no longer strikes shields multiple times, but its efficiency against shielded targets has been increased. Then we have the Jade Rabbit. Armor piercing rounds swap to high caliber rounds. This fixes an issue that could prevent the exotic fur perk from triggering. Whew. So these were all of the sandbox changes that we have to get used to with Beyond Light. Overall, I think that all of the changes that they have made with the subclass customization, the changes in mods and these sandbox updates will make sure that when we set foot on Europa, we will have to rethink builds and loadouts and find out how to incorporate these new weapons, armor pieces and damage type. This is really going to feel like new and unknown territory and I'm really excited to get going. If you want to connect with me or other gaming watchers, feel free to join the Discord, there's a link in the description. If you want to raid with us or just play Destiny with us, you can join the clan, order of the watchers, there's also a link in the description. If you found this video useful, please be sure to leave a like on the video, that really means the world to me guys and it helps the channel out a lot. If you're not subscribed to the channel, consider doing so. And if you don't want to miss out on future content, hit that notification bell. So as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.